There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's Commercial Bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help you build your future. Products and services of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company and its affiliates are subject to availability, eligibility, and applicable terms and policies. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hey, everyone. Welcome to TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. I'm Matt Burns. And you know that old saying about how you don't really understand something until you can explain it in simple terms? Yeah, that's key to selling your startup to customers and to investors. And we have two great guests on today that, that excel at keeping things simple. You're going to love today's event. Jordan Kretschner, co-founder and CEO of Rapid Robotics, is a fantastic storyteller and pitch man because he keeps things simple. And what's more, he developed this process using Kira Noodleman's past research. They've known each other for years and have a great working relationship. And on today's event, we're going to talk about presenting your company to investors and customers through simple terms. But I have other questions too. I want to know how, fu how fundraising for robotic startups has changed over the years, who's raising and who's not, and what does B Partners look for when funding a pre-seed stage company? Lastly, we're going to talk about becoming a thought leader in your area of, it, area of expertise, So, if we have time. On a different note, today is a big day for TechCrunch Live. We're on a new platform called Grip. It should make it a lot easier for, for you to attend future TechCrunch Live episodes and TechCrunch events. Uh, register once for Grip, and you'll be able to add all these events to your calendar and attend future things without an issue. We're still streaming live on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, but please register for Grip where you can ask questions to the attendees and, and network with other people as well. The link is on techcrunch.com in the top feature box right now, and it should be on the other platforms too. And we made it much easier to apply for pitch practice. Now there's a form. You don't have to chat with anybody anymore. But the, the form is available through Grip, so find it there. And we've already selected today's startups. But somebody will contact you for future events if you're selected. One more thing before we bring on Kira and Jordan. This month is all about robotics at TechCrunch. They conclude with a huge one-day free event at the end of the month. Dean Kamen, Rod Brooks, Boston Dynamics, top startups and researchers from the robotics industry will be there. And next week, TechCrunch hardware editor and robotics supervan Brian Heater will be here and hosting Forerunner Ventures and Adobotics on TCL. I'll be gone next week at Scout Camp with a bunch of bugs and teenagers, so he should have a lot of fun. Okay, well, that's it from me. Let's bring on Kieran Jordan. Thanks for being here, you two. Hey, thanks for having us. Definitely. Yeah, so we talked a bunch yesterday. We actually talked longer yesterday than what the episode goes for. So I'm pretty excited about that. But Jordan, you said something that I just want to start with. You said yesterday that you use almost the same pitch deck for customers as you do investors. And I want you, want you to explain what's different between the two. Yeah, so I mean, from our perspective, if we can tell a simple story to customers that customers buy into... Uh, then investors, as a result of customers buying into the story, will also buy into it. And so it wasn't even on purpose that this happened. Um, just over the course of about six months um, of working on the investor deck after using the customer deck in the market for a while, trying to close deals, um, the investor deck just started to look a lot more like the customer deck. And so it wasn't an on-purpose thing. But what it really stuck out to me was that the story that we are telling into a complex market, right, with a complex like new technology that this market has never bought before, investors were experiencing that same level of like lack of education in the market and how this technology works that customers were. And so the storylines ended up merging to the point where, you know, I think there's two or three slides different between our investor deck and our customer deck at this point. Sure. Now, now do you find yourself doing a lot of re-education or education simply between the two? Yeah, between in investors and customers? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say um, on the customer side of it, a lot of them have had bad experiences with robots. They've had bad experiences trying to automate their facilities, and they've had bad experiences with technology companies who overpromise, underdeliver. They bring a solution to market that's already kind of been baked, and then try to sell it into the manufacturer. It might not meet the manufacturer's needs, uh, and so a lot of what we do is working directly with manufacturers as the, one of the only companies around that sells directly to manufacturers, not through a systems integrator or a distributor, mm -hmm. we have to develop this uh, rapport with a customer where they trust us uh, and trust our solution to work. And so a lot of education goes into our business model, right? So it's a very different subscription-based business model. They're not buying a million dollars of equipment using CapEx like they have for the last hundred years when they're working with us. They're subscribing to the platform. We do a lot of education. I think we'll talk about ROI, the benefits of a subscription model in a market that's never used subscriptions to purchase before. And so on that side, there's a ton of education. On the investor side, they understand enterprise SaaS. So they understand the software side. But anytime, especially going back a couple of years ago when we were raising our seed and our A, there was a lot of um, confusion around, well, if it's software, why is there a robot at the end of it? So the feedback that we were getting was, hey, we don't like investing in things with hardware risk, sure. and we don't like investing, and we don't think that manufacturers, because of who they are, are going to buy this way. So we ended up not only having to educate the market, the customers, uh, about this business model, but investors also needed to understand why this was going to be valuable and game-changing for the industry. And so that was the education on both sides. One more question before we take a look at the deck. Well, actually, two. What, what series is this deck from? And then uh, it's... So Go ahead. Yeah, so what's, what's interesting, so the storyline in this deck hasn't changed since Series A. These are the same core slides. Um, they look different, so there's a different design that we used mm -hmm. in the Series B, but the messaging is identical. Um, and that goes all the way until the end of the deck, which we're not going to show today with our financials and success metrics and all of that, but all of this core content hasn't changed. It's really polished. It's a beautiful deck, but do you remember what it was like building under earlier iterations of it? Uh, yeah, so the first version of the deck that I built um, was very geared around the problems with robots, right? So I thought that what investors would understand is robots are incredibly hard to program. They're extremely expensive to operate. They take a long time to, to install, you know, six to eight weeks, maybe month, more months than that to actually get live. And, and so, you know, for, for me, um, oh, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you could tell us what earlier decks looked the like. Earlier this deck, one's right. really pretty. Right, right. So the earlier deck was focused on the problems with robots, how hard it is to use, how hard they are to use, how expensive they are. And what I learned in the Series A was that wasn't an emotional story. There was not really a connection to the impact on the market that not having robots was. So in the next iteration of the deck that actually got the Series A done, the focus was much closer to what you're, that was exactly basically what you're going to see here. It was about the, what is going to happen to the market if we can't deploy automation at scale into manufacturing, the beginning of the supply chain, what happens when they can't hire enough people to do the work to make the parts and the products that we take for granted every day. Uh, and so the new iteration of the deck that I redid in the middle of the Series A process focused on the bigger GDP impact and the impact mm -hmm. to the country and the world by not having enough people to do the work. And that storyline nailed it. So that storyline got the A done, it got the B done and all of that. So yeah, and, and Kira, you, you excel at helping founders go from a C to Series A to Series B and everything. How big of an is, is it to change your storyline along the way? How often does that happen? all the time. I mean, it happens as often as pivots happen, you know, easy example, this is just a proxy for DEX. One of our companies pivoted 14 times before exit. So DEX changed just as much. And I think it's perfectly uh, normal that Rapid uh, had those evolutions. Uh, yeah, Jordan, well, let's take a look at it. See the first slide here. If Julio can bring up the slide deck for me, that would be great. Okay. Okay, Fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Talk us through this slide here. Yeah, so what I was uh, just what I was saying before about the importance of establishing a baseline of the of the problem and the scale and the scope of the problem and and you know what's interesting is I I've always started my pitch decks like this and I didn't in that first series A deck and when I looked at that and why is this not communicating why is this not working in the market 
I realized that I wasn't establishing a baseline of understanding for the investors who were watching and, and listening to me. And so that baseline of understanding, I always look for a through line, some, some big connection that everybody who's in that room is going to understand and react viscerally and emotionally to. And in our case, this is the impact of the existential crisis that's been created in the market by the labor shortage. And you see here, I integrate, you know, integrated a number of different statistics that talk about the raising wages, the aging out of a majority of the workforce, the lack of replacing of that workforce. How many open positions are there for the kinds of jobs that our robots are going to be producing? And, and you know, at the time of this of the Series A, it was 865,000 unfilled positions for operators who sit in front of machines, put a part in a machine, take a part out of a machine, and put it in a box. So this is something called machine tending. So I use this slide to establish the enormity of the problem. And I always talk about here that this is a, this is a crisis that is growing to 2.2 million people by 2025. And that results in billions and billions of dollars of production in manufacturing that will not happen here in the US as a result of not having this amount of workers. And that is GDP impacting. Manufacturing makes up 14% of the US GDP on an annualized basis and growing. And so if we can't establish a workforce that's reliable, inexpensive, repeatable in this market, this is a downward spiral. Manufacturers can't afford to hire people to do the work. They can't win new business to manufacture new products. If they can't do that, they don't have the revenue to hire new workers. And we're seeing this happen. And so it's, it's, it's very, very important that we solve this. And that's what this slide covers. I think you said something important there. It's important to, to establish an emotional connection to the problem. How do you think this slide does that? And Kira, I, Kira, I would love to hear your thoughts too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it, Pairing the cost of labor, and I think the ROI being compared to labor is really important here because there's this the, because of the low deploys uh, for robotics and manufacturing. There's very uh, like there's not a lot of proxies to talk about the market size because basically some VCs I think had some burned hands of companies that robotic companies that shut down. And so comparing it to labor as, as a proxy was a really, really important. And that also fed into, you know, Jordan mentioned how similar this is to a sales deck and our ROI calculator to help customers understand a spectrum of automation and what that might look like. And, and you know, the hiring risks obviously speak for themselves, but I, I think what this speaks to like, like subliminally is saying how freaking big this market size is, uh, you know, and there's so many ways we defined it. I mean, this slide doesn't even scratch the surface, right? You know, you could instead say there's 100,000 manufacturers in the U.S. that are producing 3 trillion in output, uh, you know, every year. Um, another way we defined it that I think is really important is that, you know, back in 2019, some of the research I did is that cobots represent 16 billion in market size in terms of the hardware around it. And one of the key insights to, to the problem framing is that actually programming the flexibility of deploy is, is about 3x the cost of the robot mm -hmm. itself. So, you know, then you're extrapolating me out and saying, well, actually, this is a $50 billion market. And then Jordan's talking about machine tending, which is maybe 17% of all of manufacturing. So these numbers just, just uh, you know, explode out when you, when you start to think about them. Jordan, you're nodding your head along. So she's saying everything right? Absolutely. Kira, Kira nails it. Kira, Kira did, the research, did the initial research on this market before I was even considering uh, looking into the space. And a lot of that initial research that Kira did is what drove me to understand there is an enormous opportunity here that is completely unaddressed. Um, you know, and, you know, we might talk about it in a little bit, you know, in more detail, but the main, there, you know, there are four main issues with, with robots, right, and why manufacturers don't have them. And you see that stat up there, 98% of manufacturers do not have a robotic arm. And that emotional, that when you ask about the emotional connection, and, you know, the reason this is important is because you have to establish with the investors in the room who might not have a lot of experience with manufacturing or any experience with manufacturing or robotics, right? Because we are a software company. We're pitching a SaaS business that happens to have a robot at the end. And so for those investors, establishing just how few robots there are, that we are not living in minority report right now, right? And so there are a few industries that when you think of robots, you think, oh, they're in there. You don't think about the fact that robots or that, that humans are sitting there putting pieces of plastic into a pad printer, printing a serial number on that, and a person is doing that 4,000 times every eight hours, and they're doing that 24-7. And so by establishing just how little penetration robots actually have into the market, that's another key emotional tie in this slide 
that realization of like, there's not robots out there. There are human beings doing this horrible, monotonous work on a, on a minute by minute basis. Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, can I just add something, Matt? Yeah. I, I think another piece to what Jordan's saying is like, you're trying to get people on board with uh, like that automation and robotics is actually a good thing for the US and our economy. And that it's so incredibly important. You know, this is about being made in America again and having avoiding jobs going overseas otherwise. You, you say that as if there's people that disagree with you. I mean, I'd say every pitch nearly that this, this topic comes up, you know, and it's almost a taboo in the sense that people are a little nervous to talk about it. But I think especially from the investor side, uh, talking about customer adoption and, and what are the optics of this look like, this, this becomes really important. Great. Jordan, explain this slide for us. Yeah, so coming off of the slide about the market problem, I always find it very helpful to set the ground rules or set the, set the, the context for the investors about what kinds of tasks we're automating. And so in reality, this is a video slide here, it's not gonna be, um, but what we show here, you know, one is that if 98% of manufacturers don't have robots and we're experiencing this incredibly damaging labor shortage across the market, why don't they have them? Because, and then so this slide basically says the robotic hardware itself has been fully capable for the last 10, 15 years of executing against these tasks. The cost of and, and, and complexity of programming them, installing them, maintaining them, and overseeing them has gone up 20 fold while the cost of the arms has come down. And so when I talk about this slide, I'm basically setting the context for these are the kinds of tasks I'm talking about, mm. right? It's not lifting up a frame for a car and moving a door over to it. And you know, those giant KUKA robots that are painted red in the Tesla factory. Right. I'm talking about the dozens of millions of human beings who are sitting there. This is a hot stamper is the name of this machine sitting there for eight hours a day, holding a part, putting it on a machine spindle, hitting a button, machine goes, they take the part, they put it in a bucket. So I always show that because it shows the monotony, the repetitiveness. And then the next video on the right, I put there, that shows a rapid machine operator, our solution, executing that exact same task, faster cycle times, more, uh, 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 more reliability because it's the same thing every time as opposed to the human error that can be introduced. And it runs all three shifts doing this exact same task. I also use this opportunity, we're not gonna cover it today, to talk about the intelligence or what I call the human instincts that we've given to the robotic arm to be able to handle variability. Where the parts show up in the work cell is gonna be different every time. So we use vision and AI, deep learning, machine learning, all of those things in order to give the arm human instincts so if a part shows up slightly differently, a human goes and grabs it no matter what. A robot is always going to go to the same place it was programmed to do over and over again. So that was the first layer of IP that we had to develop was a robot that reacted in real time to the locations of the machines and the parts in the work cell. And that's what I talk about here, human instincts for robots. Yeah, and I think what's unique about this slide in our context here is the pitch deck has videos embedded into it. Now, Kira, as, as an investor, how often do you see that? I'd say 20% of the time, not super yeah. common. Does it always work or there's times where you should avoid this? Um, I think if you have a working product, that's incredible to show off. I would always show it off if you have it. Uh, you know, I think if it's tangential to the business, I mean, I look at pre-seed, so it's often, I mean, it's all always pre-product, free revenue. So if you don't yes. have something real that's related to you, then I would probably say skip it. So it just depends. All right. Yeah, and I would say that's it's a really good question. And and so what what showing this another benefit of showing a slide like this on slide three of the of the of the deck is it tells the investors right out of the gate or customers, because this is one of the customer slides also, tells them right out of the gate, this is real, right? Mm -hmm. So we actually have real technology that is deployed in real life doing work right now. In the robotic space, that's really, really important because most robotics companies spend between three and five years in R&D while they're raising capital along the way before selling a, a solution to a customer. 
And so we took a very opposite approach. We, we took a bottoms up approach that said, let's deploy a robot as fast as we possibly can using our platform into the market to prove the value and all the other stuff around it that, that makes investors say, okay, this is real. The customers say, we're getting instant ROI. The customers say, this does exactly what we, it was promised to us it would do. And so this is an opportunity right in the beginning to set the framework that, okay, these, this is not just words on a slide. There's real customers and real deployments here. I, I have a note here from our talk yesterday that you deployed robots within three months of your pre-seed funding. That's right. Well, actually, um, we yeah. So it was three months after we closed our first uh, convertible note round of, of, of seed um, that we deployed our first robot to a, our first paying customer. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Kira, put that into context for us. How often does that happen? It's a, it's basically unheard of. I mean, that's you you rarely see that even with software. We're talking about a complex software, hardware, computer vision uh, deploy. So you know that on its own, I think that's Rapid's claim to fame. It's this rapid iteration. It's this laser focus on use cases and speed. It's, you know, I mean, one of their north stars has been rapidly reducing the uh, the speed to implement, uh, just at, at insane timelines. Uh, you know, again, that's what I love about this is it's even outside of a hardware context. Yeah, great. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is this is the big one. This is the slide that covers the four major barriers of entry. And um, we talked to, my co-founder Ruddick and I talked to dozens of manufacturers before we decided that we wanted to start this company, including looking through Kara's research at, at B Partners and everything that they had put out. And there were four things that stood out to us in every conversation. And it's really important that any one of these things is a really good reason why a manufacturer would not have bought robots ever, right, to this point, or might have bought a robot, it didn't work as promised, and it you know, was collecting dust. And so this is, you know, we've established the problem in the market, the big existential crisis of the labor market. We've established that we have a solution that works, that uses inst intelligence and instincts and vision. And now we talk about, hey, if 98% of them don't have it and robots physically were capable of doing these tasks, you know, for the last 10, 15 years, why are they not doing them today? And these four reasons are that. So we've talked about the exorbitant costs. We're talking hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for a single robotic deployment where the robot might have cost 25 grand, but all of the other equipment necessary, all of the decision-making and time necessary to make the decisions about what kind of end-of-arm tool you want, you know, what kind of safety environment you want around the arm. There's an average of you know, somewhere between 15 and 30 different decisions that you have to make around the robot itself. And so that is the unmanageable complexity, the exorbitant cost, systems integrators. We are basically, we, we take on sort of Salesforce's no software and we are the, for the manufacturing sector, no systems integrators because they are the ones who come in and charge four or $500,000 to program these arms. So unmanageable complexity, exorbitant cost, months or years of timeline. By the time you decide you want to use a robot, it can be six or eight months before an SI can bring and deliver and install one for you. And then the lack of flexibility, this one's super important. A human operator, you can tell them, hey, go over here and work on this machine today. You give them about 10, 15 minutes of training and they're good to go. If they're doing it wrong, you just say you're doing it wrong, right? But robots, not the same. So robots have to be meticulously programmed to sub-millimeter accuracy and repeatability. And as a result of this, um, you know, they, they can't move, right? If you install a robot on this machine, you can't use it anywhere else unless you pay another round of exorbitant fees to the systems integrator. So it was really important that we solved all four of these things. We're not gonna cover all the slides, in this deck, but eventually, essentially what happens in the remainder of the deck that we're not gonna cover is we tick off all these boxes. We talk about how we solve each one of these four things. Yeah, that's great. Now, what I like about this is, is you've established a problem and you've shown a solution, but now you have the barriers and barriers have always been something that, that are hit or miss in pitch decks. How much of your pitch time is spent on this one particular slide? Oh man, but I just talked about it for what, like 90 seconds in a real in a real investor presentation. I would dive deep on each one of these four, probably four to five minutes. I need them, I need them desperately to understand why it's a problem, right? And to remember that my whole first pitch deck in the in the pre-seed and seed in the beginning of series A 
was all about this, right? I didn't mm-hmm. have these lead-ins about the existential crisis in the labor market and the, the, the GDP impact. I just went straight and started covering off on this stuff, but it really is important to establish why if robots can do it, and this is a question we got all the time. Well, you're saying robots could do it, so why aren't they? So this mm-hmm. was you know, kind of like answering, pre-answering the investors' questions uh, with this slide. Well, let's take a look at the next one. And, and this one, I'm going to stop you for a second. We yes. included this one. I liked it because it's very simple statements, right? And, and that's what today's episode is all about. Yeah. So simplicity is key. And, and we haven't really talked about it yet, but you know, simplicity over complexity is one of the core tenets of the rapid business. When in our research and conversations with manufacturers, we heard constantly that you know, the complexity of even thinking about how to use a robot keeps them from doing it. So we knew going in from a product perspective, but also from a go-to-market perspective, everything we show our customers is overly simplified, including our vision and our mission, right? So we envision a world without labor shortages. It's that simple. We're starting with manufacturing and these simple, repeatable machine tending tasks, and we execute this very easy <laughs> on its surface deliver the world's largest and most reliable automated workforce, right? And so this is kind of our ethos. This is what we believe needs to happen. Of course, it's much, much harder than just saying those words, but this is what we sort of live by as a company. And there's a bunch of core tenets that you know underlie this that I will talk about in some, in some investor conversations as well. But it's, if you notice so far, we've covered five or six slides and we haven't spoken once about feed speeds, tech specs. We haven't shown complex diagrams everything so far and actually everything through the entire rest of the deck is overly simplified to the core messages. We use the fact that we delivered product to market quickly and have validated with customers the value. We use that to prove out that the technology works so that we don't have to spend all this time in the pitch deck talking about how the technology works and proving that we that that it's it, that it's free. Well, we're running out of time. I, I hope we can skip forward to the pricing slides. I, I would like to talk about that, and then Kira, I, I have some questions for you as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll kick off the pricing slide on the you know that train of simplicity. Uh, this is it, right? So our pricing, unlike every other purchase that you make, and it's important to understand the market context that manufacturers are working in where if they want to buy a robot and deploy it, their only path is call a systems integrator, get them on the phone, and spend months and months and months making decisions about every little detail that's going to go into that robotic work cell. That was, again, that unmanageable complexity. We get rid of that in the pricing model by because we are selling a unified, we skipped, the, we skipped over the, the product slide, but we are selling a vertically integrated solution. There are zero decisions that the customer has to make about the equipment that goes into the rapid machine operator, our solution. And as a result of that, we're able to establish a very simple pricing model that is a recurring pricing model, um, which is obviously great for long-term customer value uh, for us. And it's also great for our customers because they know we're going to be there supporting them because if we stop supporting them, they're going to stop paying us. So the pricing model aligns incentives And it also is the first time where a a manufacturer can buy a robotic work cell with zero decisions made, zero programming time. Within a week of signing a contract, we can roll that robot into that facility, pre-trained on what to look for, and they start paying us on a monthly basis. Removing the CapEx structure, the hundreds of thousands of dollars of upfront cost, is, is it means that this is the first solution that makes robots fully accessible because this is a fraction of the cost of the human labor who's going to be working on that task otherwise, or the human labor that they can't hire in 99% of cases to work on that task. I think there's a question from the audience that that really illustrates this point. So I'm going to read this. In your experience deploying robots, have you seen a relation between deployment time and task complexity? So for example, for simple tasks, are deployment times faster versus complex time tasks? Yeah, absolutely. We had one this morning where the uh, deployment, uh, one of our deployment technicians went out to the site and two hours later posted a video in Slack saying it's done, right? This was a very simple task. There were not inbound parts coming, so it wasn't feeding via a conveyor. There was an output conveyor that we drop stuff on, but there was no fixturing. Hmm. The, the human operator is putting, these are metal pails that we are piercing uh, for the handle for the metal pails. 
The metal pail gets placed into the work cell by the person who's pulling it off the other machine. The robot picks it up, executes the task, puts it on a conveyor. Super simple task, couple of hours. The longest deployments that we do can take seven or eight hours. So still under a day when there's a lot of external equipment that we're consolidating in. So we, you know, we're, you know, uh, if there's a, a, a quality inspection station that's needed, we're connecting all of the, that equipment to our to the RMO and the RMO is then taking control over when all of those other components in the, in the work cell are activated. So there's more time required for those, but almost every deployment that we do is done in less than a day. Uh, and I should also take this moment to say how important it is for us to say no, right? Because of our approach to the market where we started by picking off the simple tasks, the machine tending, repetitive, very robotic looking tasks to begin with, of which there are millions in the US alone of these. Um, it also means that we say no to things where customers bring us um, an opportunity to automate this thing over here. And we say, that's not a good task for us for these reasons, but show us what those machines over there are doing. Cause it looks like those could be really good for us. And we talk to them about the importance of freeing up labor, um, regardless of what machines the robot is working on, you're freeing up human labor to do more complex, valuable stuff. And so the, the quick answer to the question though is yes, it is, you know, there is more time required, but because of our computer vision capabilities called smart setup, we are even the more complex uh, deployments are done in less than a day. Yeah, that's great. And smart setup launched last early last month, right? Uh, it, well, we've had it in market for a little bit, but the public announcement of yeah, it okay. was a couple of months ago. Yeah. The press release I read was from like that's June right. 6th. That's right. Yeah. All right. Now, throughout today's conversation, we refer referred to Kira's research multiple times. And I spent the last 24 hours Googling all of her articles. They're, they're fantastic. You, you've written some amazing papers out there. How, how does that work as an investor or how does that help you, you excel? Yeah. So, you know, it's all about having a prepared mind, at least on the investing side and knowing what we're looking for. And then we rely on founders like Jordan and Ruddock to, you know, we say, show us the way they're really on that frontier curve, but we need our thesis as a starting point. And so it, it's a really comprehensive deep dive that, that I do with support of my team and our advisors. You know, we look at incumbents, we look at rising star startups, we look at, you know, why it's especially important why some startups have failed just as much as some of the early successes. You know, you got to consider regulation, supply chain inefficiencies, and particularly everything I just mentioned for deep tech is an order of magnitude harder. And so it's just a different lens to be looking at all that stuff with. And for us on the B Partners side, we're looking at time to market and we're looking at what kind of risk is this? Is, this, is it a market risk or a tech risk? Sure. And as I mentioned with deep tech, we're, we're normally looking at uh, tech risk. Yeah, now I've been reading this one. I should have it up and I do, but it's on like two monitors away. Um, B's machine to machine learning vector. The paper that you published on that, you're smiling. This this is a, an incredible paper here. Now, when you look at these things, how does that influence your investing? Oh yeah, I mean, it, it's just it's like if you went if you go through that paper, what we've identified is sort of how does innovation get to market? How are we digitizing the physical world? How are we doing that in a factory and beyond it? Um, you know, what what does ROI look like? And even when you're building a MVP, for example, you know, you still needed an eye for economics when you're in what we call wave two, which is building out the MVP. And something also that uh, someone just asked about that we talk about is the importance of platforms, which is, you know, nail a first use case. Jordan talks about machine tending, but how do you extract those learnings and, and build a productized platform versus a service business model? I mean, that to me, that's the heart of, of what makes these companies win, that which includes rapid. And so that, you know, that that's super exciting. Um, and then also kind of like with VC, you're always asking, why now? Why not five years ago? Why not in five years? And so I, I could go on about that, but uh, there's, a, there's a special emphasis there too. Yeah. Now, how long have you guys worked together? Oh gosh, it's been probably four. Yeah. At least four, four. years. Yeah. 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 Right. Like and, and, and how is that relationship? Is, is B on the board still? Yes. Uh, Yes. Or, go ahead, Jordan. Yes. It, well, it, it's an observer seat now. So we've, yeah. raised, we've raised a couple, uh, a couple of large rounds since then. And so, uh, so, but, but B will, and has an observer seat and, you know, I still, I talked to, to Kira and, and her partner at B, Michael Berlzheimer, uh, on, on a, between the two of them on a weekly basis at this point. We're uh, besties. <laughs> yeah, and and so and we had actually we had met when I was advising uh, a, a a company that was a B Partners portfolio company. That's where I met uh, I met Kira first. 
and where yes. she started sharing with me all of this amazing data and research that she had been collecting and, and, and collating into like really comprehensible, you know, decks um, where if you're just looking at this thinking, how has nobody solved this yet? Um, and, and so certainly I think the influence of, of Kira uh, and the work that she had done was a big influence in, in, in Ruddick and I deciding to start this business. Right. So Jordan, as a founder, when you, when you find a, an investor as knowledgeable as Kira and, and is published, is that somebody you go after first or is that somebody you, you eventually want to land? Oh man. Um, I mean, for me, there's every investor we bring around the table has different value, right? Like, and, and one oh, of the, that's, things, so, I, that's I, such a, such a canned answer. It's such, I, but, but, I mean, but it is. I mean, it's, it's and, 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 you know, in some of the cases, the investors have deep connections into the industrial ecosystem, right? At, you know, big companies like GE and GM and, you know, uh, big medical device companies like, you know, Cardinal Health. And, and, and so there's a lot of value in those relationships and, and keeping those investors abreast of what's happening in board meetings. Whereas with, you know, there are some investors that you work with a little bit more strategically, and those tend to be those earlier stage investors. And so in the earlier stages, I'm not going to cop out on this one, I promise. In the earlier stages, it is vitally important for me to find people who understand the market, maybe even better than I do. Um, and, and there's a partnership with all of my early stage investors um, you know, Graycroft was another early stage uh, invested in, in, in the seed uh, along with B partners. And, you know, and, and so I worked with both very closely because they were the first to step up and say, we truly understand where this is going and the potential. And that level of partnership at those very early stages when the roller coaster is rocking and it's, you know, highs of one day yes. and super lows the next day, having people who understand from the early stages that that long view right? And that these bumps in the road, we're going to look back and they're going to look like little pebbles at one day. That's, that's where I, in, in those first rounds of financing, I always look for that kind of, uh, that kind of an investor and that kind of a relationship. Well, the last question then goes to Kira. What, what do you look for in a founder when you invest? Oh man, uh, so many things. I would say an insatiable passion for what they're doing. We talk about a mercenary versus missionary founder. Would they be doing this whether or not we give them money? We talk about deep market insights and kind of an earned insight that, you know, is, is what has made Silicon Valley famous. Um, you know, I think it's, it's a founder that also has deep empathy for the problem they're solving for, you know, but in all directions, it's not just on the customer side, it's the employees they're hiring, that everybody is, is creating career and life risks to, to join this journey. And uh, certainly for me at B Partners, because we are so hands-on in our partnership, you know, we want founders who want to partner with us too. You know, it wouldn't be the same if Jordan didn't want to take my call. Right. And I've, I'll just, I'll add to this because the, the founding team at Rapid is very unique um, in that, you know, my background, I never worked with robots or manufacturers before. Where I had done, I'd built a business that was an enterprise SaaS, you know, cloud native business back starting in 2009. And so I was coming to this market with a very different perspective, right? Where other robotics companies are building arms or building technologies and selling those, selling that hardware. I was coming to this saying, we can make this technology accessible and affordable if we look at the long-term customer value, just like we would with an enterprise SaaS business, where my co-founder is the NCTO is the highly technical, worked at intuitive surgical, building the Da Vinci surgical robot. So, and then our founding team, we had four others who joined us right out of the gate, all come from varying backgrounds of supply chain operations, manufacturing. And so we put together this team with a very diverse perspective. And I think I, I know I know that you know Kira does talk about this all the time, how that, you know, the, you know, having not just two roboticists, you know, coming out of a PhD program, building a company out of it, but having the business meets the technology and understanding where those two can, can merge to, to provide extraordinary value, um, I think is something that it makes, that sets rapid apart and makes us unique in the market as well. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a great place to leave it because we're, we're quite a bit over. It was a great conversation, but we're still not done with the show. So I, I appreciate the, the conversation and the pitch deck review. That was great. But we need to move on to pitch practice. Pitch practice is where we bring on three entrepreneurs, and they have two minutes to give you an elevator pitch, no decks, and then you give them four minutes of feedback. So with that said, I'm hoping to bring on the first, uh, first person. We have Stephen Morell. He's the founder and CEO of Juris Dread. Stephen, are you there? I see you there. If you can turn on your camera and your mic and correct my pr pronunciation. 
Morel. Yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Like That's right. Well, nice to meet you, Stephen. And you, you have two minutes. Let, let's see that elevator pitch starting now. All right. 80% of the city of New Orleans was flooded during Hurricane Katrina, and with it, much of its public records and land records. I saw firsthand how this created a crisis on top of a crisis with millions of homeowners who were scattered around the country and those trying to move home and rebuild their homes, and they couldn't find their ownership records. I was a young real estate attorney at the time, and my house flooded as well, and I saw their pain firsthand. This is a much bigger problem, however. This is a $34 trillion U.S. real estate transaction market at stake here. Seven million transfers per year and thousands more of foreclosures and blighted and abandoned piece parcels of real estate all over in every parts of the country. Now, there are millions of professionals who work in this industry in, uh, as legal professionals and government tax collectors and in, in institutional investors who play a vital role in trying to get this very difficult problem solved and getting clear title and transfer ownership but they're still doing so with one hand time behind their backs. They're using old archaic manual paper heavy processes. I know I did this myself back in the day and I can tell you it's slow, it's inefficient and it really creates problems. There's gotta be a better way and Juristate is that better way. We've created a, a single web mobile and integrated platform allowing anybody to access title records, search stakeholders alive or dead, send track notifications, prove everything you did, and actually clear title with clicks of buttons instead of driving to courthouses and making copies. And we've already tested this out. In the last first three quarters since we launched in 2021, we've generated over a quarter million dollars of revenue in, in our beta phase with no marketing. And we've since opened our seed round of investment funding and raised over $300,000 of seed capital so far. And we are excited to take this to the rest of our seed round of $1.5 million to build out our team, our tech, and deploy a comprehensive marketing strategy. Thank you. Right on the money, right on two minutes. Thank you for that. Kira, let's start with you. Any feedback? Yes. Uh, great job, Stephen. Loved the pitch. It was very visceral and emotional for me as you started to solve, uh, talk about the problem. Um, couple questions. One is why now? Why is it? I mean, I know some of this climate stuff is, is newer, but why is it the solve before? Um, what's your ideal customer profile? And also what's the right level of, for this problem? We always look at what's the right level of human computer interaction. So is it a workflow tool? What is, what is that, you know, right, uh, right solution size? Yeah. Um, I mean, first question is why, why now? Uh, look, real estate title records is not something that's been digitized for a very long time. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's it's at the county level. And so it's for 30, 3,100 counties in America. And so to get them all talking the same language and to have, you know, making sense of that on a data sense, it's really, really difficult to do. And really the last five, 10 years, title plants have become more and more uh, prevalent and they've, they've been aggregating all this data, making it available for a tech company like ourselves to tap into that to a single source and be able to provide a product to the marketplace. Um, our you know, customer profiles are going to be the, all the folks who, who participate in that in this transactional industry on a daily basis, legal professionals, title, title insurance, mortgage servicers who pull title sometimes five, 10 times in the life cycle of, a, of one loan uh, as they're servicing it. Um, each of these have software companies that they run their day-to-day -day operations, but in every single one of them, when it gets to running title, there's a gap in the software. They say, leave your software now, go over here and order title, come back and retype in what your title research says to do. It's a, it's a big chasm that, that needs to be filled. And this is exactly what does that. That's great. Steven, Steven I'm going to interrupt you and let, let Jordan give you some feedback. Oh, please. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to you know talk a little bit about the entry into the pitch and what it did to my brain as I was listening to it. So I think you you started off with a visceral emotional connection. Somebody, something that every, like I said in, in my first part of my presentation, something everybody can identify with. Now, the problem with, with the example you used is my brain started going down. This is some form of disaster relief company, right? And then about halfway through, I was like, wait a second, this is a real estate transaction company, kind of, right? And so you, it's very important that when you're starting the pitch, you want to make sure that the context that you're setting for the investors is communicating exactly what you want it to and not giving it almost like a head fake. Right. You got you use this great visceral example that made me go, oh, wow, what's this going to be? And then I was like, wait, what is this? Right. Um, I thought it had to do with like, you know, uh, coming back from from natural disasters. And so that would be, you know, my, my one piece of feedback is just make sure your opening 
with the context and make sure that what you're communicating is going to resonate correctly mm -hmm. with the audience and not because remember they don't know what you're about to say. They're listening to what you're saying right now. Right. And, and so, you know, they're making sense of what this company is about as you're talking. And if they start to go down a different path with what the company is in their head, and by the way, everybody in that room might go down a slightly different path the, to the, to the, um, anytime you can get them to focus on the exact same and, and picture in their heads, exactly what you're talking about. You're always going to have a much better time going through the rest of the presentation. And you're not going to get silly questions out of left field that aren't relevant. Right. That's great feedback. Stephen, I have seconds left. So Stephen, I have another question for you. Something you lay out the why now, but what it really leads me to is then, well, why you? If this is all available and we can all start digitizing these titles, and we've looked at titles a lot. So I, that would really be my very next question. You've got 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent my, la my last 20 years of my career uh, clearing titles to real estate. I started it actually post Katrina in New Orleans and didn't stop there. And I've written on it, I've, I've taught on it, and I've built products and actually exited from that, uh, from uh, creating title insurance products to clear blighted properties in large cities across America. Mm, great. So Katrina was near and dear to you. It, very much so, yeah. Yeah, got it. Very good. Well, that's that's great feedback. And I hope to see you back again. Please apply again, and we'll have you back with, when you, with an updated pitch. Awesome. Thanks for so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next one up is Dan Flynn. He's the CEO of Bear Cover. Dan, how are you? I am reasonably well. It is a little late in Berlin, and no, I am not German. I'm actually uh, Irish. So if you hear an accent, it is not. It is not German. Yeah. Well, thank you thank for you joining very much us for the from opportunity, guys, By the way. All right, great. Well, you have two minutes to give us your pitch. Starting now. Super. So, hi, I'm Dan from Bear Cover, and we're focused on providing excellent nighttime care for your aging loved ones in nursing homes everywhere. So, what's the problem? Well, basically, nursing homes that have less staff at night are able to perform less physical checks on their residents, which leads to more incidents, accidents, and problems for your loved ones in their care. You probably already know that much like hospitals, nursing homes are finding it really difficult to hire and retain staff, and that nighttime staff are among the most expensive due to unsociable hours. What you probably don't know is that at nighttime in nursing homes, most accidents happen inside of residents' rooms where no one is around to see them, and it can often be hours before these accidents are discovered. You might say, hey, what about sensors? They've been around for years. But if you walk into a nursing home now, you'll actually be surprised that they're pretty much not in use in any nursing home in any sort of widespread fashion. And this is mostly due to the consent issues, the implementation and capex of installing those systems, as well as the limited value they provide to most residents who are in quote unquote high risk or have dementia, for instance. That's why at Bear Cover, we've developed a simple robotics device that is able to see through closed doors from the corridor and send alerts directly to caregivers related to residents' movements. With the same number of staff, nursing homes can perform 20 times the number of physical checks on their residents without ever having to install a single device inside a resident's private bedroom. We combine an ultra-wideband radar sensor with a mobile autonomous robot that lets us check movement signatures and then direct alerts directly to caregivers' smartphones. Much like you guys, we are big fans of the subscription service model and we record, uh, service our clients on a monthly subscription service. Uh, we're in the pre-seed stage now, so we actually built our first robots and sold them to nursing homes on this kitchen table behind me. Uh, we're raising 400,000 here in Germany with most of our round closed, and we're working already with some of the largest nursing home providers here in Germany and in Europe. And hopefully one day you'll see our product in the US as well, changing the best practice for nighttime care in nursing homes there too. Thank you very much. Dan, that was fantastic. Jordan, we can start with you on this one. Yeah, so I can imagine that there's um, relevance for this technology to other markets and industries. Um, are you planning on starting just in the nursing home industry? Is this is that your is that your end game, or does this have bigger ramifications for uh, you know all kinds of security and you know sort of maintenance checks and other and other things? And is it applicable? Yeah, great question. So I think that nursing homes for us uh, had a relatively easy bar to entry. We had access to that market. Also, it really answers your why now question because they're like really acute staffing issues because of demographic issues across these sectors. So that was easy. If it was a choice between nursing homes and hospitals, which would be the next market, they also posed a much easier beachhead than hospitals, which is maybe more critical care going on. Uh, yes, there is a market for similar devices to operate, let's say, in uh, property reviews and security stuff, but we haven't explored that fully yet. So 
yes, there's an extension there, whether we pursue it or somebody pursues it with a license of our technology, we don't really know. That would be up to the developments in the future. Yeah. Jordan, anything else? Yeah, I was, I was going to let Kira ask a question. I have one comment that I was going to save to the end and make sure, I, make sure Kira gets a question in. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Sure. So uh, I wanted to understand uh, what you're anticipating for adoption rates. I think there's some similarities to what you're pitching to even actually what Jordan pitches, which is that yep. manufacturers, that nursing homes are going to be slow in their adoption rate. And I think your buyer is going to be different than your user. And so how have you thought about that challenge? Yeah, so um, users, we think about, they have an aha moment, which is pretty simple. The devices are on use. As soon as they see something that they wouldn't have seen otherwise, a resident fall, a resident wander, some incident, they're immediately your champions. Yeah, so, so this is relatively well known. The tricky part that we're working out with the clients now is what is the return on investment for a nursing home operator of a system like this? So yes, the complicated thing is that it's multifaceted. So you have, let's say, a collection of first order effects, which are really, how do you pull resources from different parts of a nursing home now that these are working? For instance, can you pull work from daytime administrative document documentation work into nighttime now that you have more time? Can you allow your staff to no longer be tethered to a single area and instead basically do, do like demand planning for a nursing home so they can move to multiple areas to tackle issues? So, so this is the first order effects. And then your second order effects are basically, okay, how do I affect uh, staff retention? Yeah, so it's like a 12,000 euros cost or more in the States to replace a single caregiver. If you're turning over 20% of your staff in a large nursing home in an urban area that adds up so how do i inflect this in a positive manner and then also most nursing homes report uh, serious incidences and hospitalizations to uh, care companies insurance companies so over the long-term data that these homes have collected after i get out all the stochastic incidents of my system six months in 12 months in how do i inflect that downwards so these are kind of how we think about changing that environment awesome good answer Cool. So the one piece of feedback that I'll have for you is like th this, this company is primed for a very emotional connection in an investor pitch, right? Everybody has elderly um, relatives. Everybody has relatives or knows people who have relatives who've been in nursing homes. We all know about the, the shortage in nursing, the labor shortage in nursing homes right now. And, and, and so what I would do if I were you, especially in a quick pitch, is establish right out of the gate the severity of the problem in terms of the impact it has on society. How many people pass away that would have been, that might have made it or been saved as a result of nursing staff shortages where they can't check up as much as they should on their patients and, and residents in, in, the, in the homes. I think that you, um, the data I'm sure is out there, but I think it would be really amazing for you to add some, some real data with, you know, from, from real sources that talk about the, the net impact of not having enough nurses in nursing homes to do enough checks on their residents. What does that mean for those residents uh, and, and their families? Um, and I think some quick hitting um, high level stats that really draw that emotion out of like, this, is, this can be life and death, I think would be very yeah. powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that is a, it's such an emotional hook for people. And um, most of it, and I know we're over time, so sorry for monopolizing your clock. Yeah, um, I think for most people, like even our early investors that came in, you know, we were actually in a nursing home last night till two in the morning with one of our investors who was doing due diligence. <laughs> and he said, you know, my father was in a nursing home for, for a long time and we paid a lot of money and he always got the worst care imaginable. You know, so every, even the people that we pull in are emotionally connected to a subject like this. Yeah. Th right. This is my show, so I can go over, but I want yeah, to know sure, why, sure. why are you building this? Yeah, so um, this is an interesting question. So we originally started building devices for the home. Yeah, like every naive robotics team, you say, I'm going to build a, a device for the home. Uh, corona hit, and we realized that a lot of our elderly relatives were cut off from services. Yeah, so it kind of made sense to build devices that would support somebody's ability to age in place. This is the ambient assisted living is the term. And when we were doing that, we, uh, we were introduced to a man who ran a nursing home, uh, he's a nursing home manager, and he just said, yeah, I have this problem where at nighttime my residents fall or wander off and fall, and we find them like three, four, five hours later. It's a real problem. Like the staff are very upset, the family are upset, and uh, yeah, we don't really know what to do about it. So then my team at the time was like, that can't be right. So we cold called 100 nursing homes in Germany and 100 nursing homes in Ireland and like cross checked this with our network of people who had worked in nursing homes. My great auntie was in a nursing home. We knew them well. And we basically established that the main difference between these care profiles in countries was that one country had 
four times the number of staff at night time and the other one so in in ireland for instance a nursing home of 50 people is managed by between four and six caregivers two being nurses four being caregivers and in germany it's 100 people managed by two people at night time and the main difference between those care systems is that in uh, ireland they'll check you every 30 to 90 minutes depending on your care need and in germany there are some places that don't check at all and this put is all that actually, put all that in the beginning of your pitch like this is a market people don't understand and you've just broken it down into very powerful ways and i think it's you know completely agree with jordan yeah Yeah, Yeah, that's great dan i don't want to take i don't want to take over your show mark so uh, maybe i'll add you guys after and you can give me some some tips on linkedin that would be great that's fantastic best of luck thanks so much guys bye bye for sure all right great well that, that was interesting all right we have one more left jeff zika ceo of ergo ai Jeff, how are you? Are you there? I don't see you in Zoom. Uh, There you are. I got you now. If you can turn on your mic and your camera. Halfway there. There we are. Finally. Okay. Hi there. I'm um, Jeff Zika. Thanks for the introduction. Great. Well, you have two minutes to present your company, sir, starting now. Okay. Well, basically, 18 years ago, I almost died in a car accident. Uh, I was driving in Kuala Lumpur on a ring road, uh, taking an off-ramp, um, and a motorcycle tried to pass me on the shoulder while I was going on the off-ramp. I swerved to uh, miss him, hit the uh, divider, uh, flipped over end over end seven times, ended up in the hospital for three months, had several surgeries, and spent the next two years on crutches. Um, my daughter just learned how to drive. You know, my accident happened to me. It could happen to her. Um, and it's very unlikely that vehicles that she's going to drive or vehicles that all young drivers drive have any of the advanced safety systems that are now coming into vehicles. Only 6% of the vehicles on the road today have these systems. And actually, I saw a report just recently that said it was 3% um, have any of these advanced safety systems that could save our families when they get behind the wheel. Um, so what we did is myself... And my co-founders are all Microsoft, uh, ex-Microsoft and uh, well, Microsoft veterans um, with over 100 years experience developing products and shipping worldwide. And we came together and put together a product called Soteria Vision, which basically adds new car safety um, to any vehicle, anywhere, anytime. Um, It's a smart, uh, connected suite of IoT devices um, that can be easily user installed. It provides e-call capability for emergency response. We um, provides a distracted driver monitoring and ADAS systems um, for vehicle safety. And also uniquely, um, it does facial recognition on the drivers. So we know exactly who's driving the vehicle um, and can provide security and anti-theft um, and user and um, vehicle specific telematics for insurance purposes. Okay, a primary market is parents of young children or of uh, new drivers in the U.S., particularly in Washington State and expanding nationwide. Um, we, pr- we earn money by charging three cents per mile for every mile driven by vehicles equipped with our systems, a $20 a month uh, data and app fee, and also monetizing our data for autonomous mapping companies. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop you there, Jeff. Thank you very okay. much. Kira, can we start with you? Yes, for sure. Uh, so uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, certainly hooked me at the start with uh, your personal story. I was curious because this sounds like an existing technology applied to you know, an underserved market. What defensibility really looks like and means to you? Uh, and then you, know, you mentioned this is all about uh, driver safety and protection and saving lives. And so I'm curious with your uh, you know, mix of hardware software solution, you know, what type of liability do you now hold by being the safety system? Okay. Um, we're limiting our liability because we do not talk back to the vehicle at all. Um, we're, we're strictly a warning system. The driver is always the driver of the vehicle legally and in other ways. Um, so we limit our liabilities greatly in that case. Okay. We also don't record in cabin video except in emergency situations. So we're not providing, we're not uh, impacting any privacy issues. Okay. Um, as far as providing the warnings and the driver doesn't heed the warnings, we're providing false alerts and so forth and so on. Uh, that is something we're concerned about. Um, we are addressing with our legal team. Um, also, we're trying to avoid that as much in software. 
Uh, right now, we are completely in development mode, um, simply because of the fact we can't get hardware at this point because of logistics time, the logistics problem caused by COVID. So we can't go to market. So we can continue the development. We're ready to go to market. Uh, we just can't do it right now. That's a great moment to say, should we pivot? Do we need, uh, you know, dependencies that, that aren't going to be, you know, hindered by crazy supply chains right now? Actually, we've um, received inquiries from a government in Africa regarding using our distracted driver monitoring system, not for a video recording for distracted driver monitoring, but for the um, emergency alert capabilities and being able to handle VIP alerts and, ha and contact emergency first responders and so forth in that country. Um, and so we've looked at pivoting on a much lower hardware platform using the same modem technology, but using a much lower end CPU and so forth and so on to provide just that capability without the DMS, but with just the impact detection and the um, e-call, quote unquote, E911, whatever you want to call it, um, and provide the location tracking capabilities. And that's something I'm actually working on developing right now. Um, I don't have a prototype ready for it, but it will probably within a week or so. Um, we are Jeff, testing. Jeff, devices. I'm going to pause you right there so we can get some feedback Sorry. from Jordan. Hey, Sorry. yeah. So um, my main question is, you talked about 3 to 6% of automobiles on the road today having an advanced safety system. Right. I was really wondering, what is an advanced safety system? Because I think about things like OnStar, right, that's been around for a long time, that comes to be standard in most vehicles, that does crash, you know, major events, sort of crash. It doesn't have, in, you know, a camera inside at least yet. But when you say advanced safety system, what are you referring to? I'm kind of missing that because in my head, three to 6%, I'm like, well, you know, every new car has advanced safety systems of some kind, right? And so I'm just trying to wrap my head around what, what defines advanced. So versus what you're, yeah. if I can, Jordan, I think you're, you're asking Jeff in his pitch to define this in, in okay. more granular yeah. terms, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would be, that would be the feedback is, is okay. you know, certainly cover off on what does it mean to be advanced versus, you know, the, the 93 to 94 or 92% or whatever that, that don't have advanced safety systems. Like what's the difference and the delta between what you're doing and what exists there? Yeah, that was, that was my feedback as well. Sure. I'm, I'm a big car guy. I live in Michigan and, and all cars have advanced safety th systems. So I think it would be great if you can redefine that in your pitch. And I would encourage you to reapply to pitch practice because I would love to hear this again. Okay. Well, just quickly on your question though, um, sure. you, as you find by AAA and by the, or the National Tra Highway Traffic Safety Board, it's basically the advanced safety systems are the distracted driver monitoring and, and ADAS type systems, advanced driver assistance systems that monitor following distance, lane keeping and so forth and so on. Very few cars have the lane keeping, have the following distance, have auto braking, have um, very, even less vehicles have any distracted driver monitoring at all. Um, mm -hmm. Right now it's basically only GM and um, Subarus have that. So. Yeah, yeah. And one data point for that is it's just new cars. I drive an old car. Yeah, exactly. My old car doesn't have and a lot of people drive old cars. Well, you we drive that truck excursion sitting out front. You try to drive, you hit something, one of those, it's not going to get damaged. Whatever you hit's going to be totaled. So. <laughs> All right. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your time and please reapply for pitch practice. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Well, Jordan, Kira, this has been a fantastic episode. I, I have compliments coming in from all over Twitter. So thank you so much. And, and please keep in touch. Um, this has been great. And next week, next week, Brian Heater is going to be here instead of me. He's talking to Forerunner Ventures and Adol Robotics on TechCrunch Live. And then the following week, we have that one-day TechCrunch uh, Robotics event with everybody that's anybody. So please, please uh, attend that as well. Well, thank you again, and we'll see you next week.